Hey friends, it's Chubby Meeple back with another Kickstarter preview for you. Today we're going to take a look at Treacherous. This is from DNA Games. They're a local publisher here in Indianapolis. Uh, and I was really excited when they reached out for me to do a review. Uh, I love supporting local folks uh, here. So um, I'm going to jump over. This is a game obviously seeking funding on Kickstarter. Uh, good bluffing deduction game. Two to seven players, which is incredible. Uh, but I'm going to jump over the table, give you a brief overlook of an overview of how the game plays, and then I'll come back here and tell you what I think of Treacherous. To set up Treacherous, you're first going to uh, give each player a player screen. Uh, so you have your player screen and on the back of the player screen is a reference as to the various grifters and the Lady Luck cards that are in the game and what they do either on their own or in combination with one another. So each player will get a player screen. You will also place the four raise cards for the four suits in the center of the table so all players can see them and be able to um, place gems on them to up their value as the game progresses. You're going to set the round marker to a number of rounds equal to the number of players plus two. So in the case of a four player game, we're gonna have six rounds that get played. You're gonna deal each player one grifter card and three lady luck cards, and then form a deck of each that stay in, in the middle of the table so that players can access those. You'll place the dice, the shell casings, the uh, small gems and the large gems in, uh, to, you know, in reach of all players, creating a bank of the gems. Each player is also going to get one large gem and five small gems to begin the game with. Gems are very important. These essentially act as your victory points or your win condition for the end of the game. You'll randomly determine a first player and give that player the first player shot glass. Very thematic. <laughs> so um, that is how you set up Treacherous. Treacherous is going to be played over a series of rounds while players uh, will, that will see players taking actions to increase the value of the three card poker hand that they are trying to build, as well as collecting gems and earning gems. After a set number of rounds, in our case six, there will be a reveal phase where players will reveal their poker hands. They'll have the ability to do some final um, betting on the, or not betting, but some final raising actions on the four different suits in the game to kind of strengthen their own hand. Poker hands will be revealed. The pot that is collected over the course of the rounds will be won by the player with the best poker hand. And at that point, the player with the most gems will be the winner. That is one way the game can end. The other way the game can end is if, in the case of this four player game, if three other players are eliminated, the player that is last standing wins the game as well. Uh, and it should be, I, I should also point out that if, if the game is won with, an, with one player standing, that's it. This player would win, these three players would be eliminated, that would be the end of the game. If, however, at the end of the set number of rounds, more than one player is still around and still alive, so to speak, um, the gems are calculated and even eliminated players can still win. So if this player had been eliminated during the course of the game, but finished the game with the most gems, this player would still win, even though they had been eliminated and weren't part of the reveal phase at the end of the game. So that's the basic setup and a brief overview of your win condition. Let's take a look at how the game is played. The game is going to be played, over again, over a series of rounds, and you're going to start with the first player. At the start of the first player's turn, the first player has to first ante up. So this player has their, their one large gem, their five small gems. In a four-player game, the ante is two gems. So they would simply pay two gems into the middle of the table to create a pot that players will begin playing for. This player now has the option to that they're going to take two actions, a standard action and a card action, or they can take two standard actions. Let's take a look at the standard actions they can take. One option of a standard action is to take income, which simply means they take one gem from the bank and they add it to their supply. Uh, so they have an extra gem. That is one action that they can take. Another action they can take is to raise. And by raising, they simply take one of their gems and place it on any one of the four suit cards in the middle of the table. This essentially is raising or increasing the value of that particular suit. So now in this case, this beer bottle suit, this green suit, is now stronger than the other three suits. So it acts as a tiebreaker during the reveal phase at the end of the game. So this is a way to strengthen uh, your own hand that's there. A third action that can be taken is uh, what's called an identity crisis, where this player can take can draw the top card off the grifter deck and then choose between this grifter card and the grifter card they were dealt which one they want to keep discarding the other by shuffling it back into the grifter deck. The fourth standard action that can be taken is handcrafting 
which this allows them to begin building uh, a stronger poker hand than what they have in hand. To hand craft, they would choose one of the three Lady Luck cards that were dealt to them, discard it, draw a new card and add it to their hand, and then shuffle the discarded card back into the deck. If this player were to choose to take two of those standard actions, so let's say for the first action they wanted to take the income, so they would take the income and add it onto their, uh, you know, back into their supply here. They could then, if they were going to do a second standard action, the first standard action is always free. They can just do it. If they choose to do a second standard action, they must first roll the yellow two pip die. Now this is obviously a prototype, so in this case you have four blank sides and then there are two sides of this die that have a white sticker on it. They would roll this die and if it comes up blank, they're able to take that action for no cost. So they can take their second standard action. Maybe I just want to take another income and take another gem and add it in. I could do so. If, however, this die were to come up with the white pip symbol on here, so two of the, two of the four sides again have pips, so if you roll a pip, you have to pay one gem to the bank in order to take a special action. So if you were taking an income action, paying a gem and collecting a gem, it, it turns into a wash. But if your second action, you wanted to do card cr your hand crafting and discard a card, you could pay a gem and take that second action, discarding a card, drawing a new one, and shuffling the discarded card back in. So those are the standard actions. You also then have the ability, so let's say we did the standard first standard action, we took income, we took a gem. For our second action, because we don't want to be at the luck of the, at the, the mercy of the die, we decide that we want to take a card action. Card actions are where you are declaring your you're, you're claiming that you have a particular grifter, a particular card in your hand, or a combination of the two. And let's take a look at what I mean by that. This player down here, our first player with the, with the first player shot glass, the grifter that he was dealt is the mayor. The mayor. And you can see on here, he has a value of five, or, or he cares about the five, meaning he pairs with the number five card really well. He has a standard ability. If I take a look at the player screen here, there's a reference sheet on the back. The mayor is a VIP. This character is worth seven gems at the end of the game. So if at the end of the game, this player here is still, our first player here is still the mayor, or still has the mayor grifter in front of him, it's worth seven gems at the end of the game. So that can be pretty valuable because gems are, again, your win condition uh, as long as there are multiple players still left for the reveal phase. If, however, I wanted to take a card action called taxation. Taxation allows me to take one gem from a player and one gem from the pot. So I can claim taxation and say, for my card action, I'm gonna tax everyone. And so I'm gonna say I'm gonna taxation, I'm gonna take one from the pot, I'm gonna and I'm gonna take one, or one from this player and one from the pot, and I'm gonna add them to my bank over here. By doing, by saying taxation, I'm claiming that I have the mayor and I have the number five card in my hand. If someone were to challenge this and I was proven to be lying, as in I either am not the mayor or I don't have a five in my hand, or both, maybe I don't have a five and I'm not the mayor, then I would get dismissed and, I, and my action would be canceled. I would not be able to take that action. We'll talk about dismissal here in a second. Um, so when you're claiming and you're doing card actions, I very much reminded me of, of, of Coup. So if you've ever played Coup, you have a couple of characters in front of you that allow you to do certain actions. If you say you're taking an action, someone can call you out if, you're, if they're correct that you were lying. Your card goes face up and you're now down a character. This is somewhat similar to that. So if I say I'm claiming taxation, I need to have the mayor, which we saw I already have, and I need to have a five in my hand. And if I look at the three cards I was dealt, I have an ace and two fives. So I'm able to do this action truthfully. If the player that I was targeting over here decides that he doesn't think I'm the mayor, he doesn't think I'm the mayor or he doesn't think I have a five, for any reason he thinks I'm lying in some way, he can challenge me. When he challenges, I simply have to prove that I'm correct. So I would show I have my mayor and I have a five in my hand. I would show those. This player over here who did the challenge is now dismissed, which means he's essentially pushed out of the saloon where we're playing this poker game. He then has the ability to try to duel his way back in and remain in the game. If he does not, he's just eliminated from the game. He would reveal his grifter uh, to all players because there's some deduction that can, can happen trying, when you're trying to figure out uh, you know, who's got what grifter. Uh, I know, for example, this player down here is the mayor. There's one other mayor somewhere. It could be one of these other players, or it could be in this grifter deck. There are two of each of the grifters in the, in the grifter deck.
So this player would be eliminated if, if he didn't duel his way back in. He would reveal his grifter. He would keep his Lady Luck cards hidden because he could still end up winning the game. And some of the Lady Luck cards have things that prevent, uh, prevent some actions that can still be taken uh, against him. So he would keep those hidden as well. So he can still participate somewhat, although he's not going to take any standard actions or card actions any longer. If, however, he wants to tr attempt to duel his way back in, he first has to pay five uh, gems back to the bank, and he can do that with just one of his large ones. And he puts two gems kind of out in front uh, and kind of puts them up uh, and, and tries to duel. So he pays his five to the bank. He puts his two gems out here. And now this player and this player take the dueling dice. The standard dueling dice are the two green dice. These green dice have five blank sides and one pip, or essentially one success. And each player is going to roll one of these dice simultaneously until one of them rolls a success and yells hit. Once that happens, they have won the duel and the other player has been eliminated. So let's say this was the result. This player rolled the pip. This player rolled the blank. He yells hit. This player gets eliminated. So he would reveal that he has the preacher card. He would be eliminated. So we just, you know, we lay a screen down. If you want, he still keeps his Lady Luck card secret and behind his screen, so the other players do not know what he has. But this player has been eliminated. The player who did the eliminating would take two gems, and in the case of the example here, where I was doing the taxation, I would be able to complete my action of taking one from the pod and one from that player. Uh, so that would be there. I would then take my Mayor card, because it's now been revealed, and it would get shuffled back into the Grifter deck, and I would get a new Grifter. So, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, in terms of the duel, if this player had won the duel and successfully dueled his or her way back into the match, so this player would be eliminated, in other words. This five would still stay in hand. The mayor would stay exposed. I wouldn't take the, the, the gems from the pot or from the mayor, or, or from the pot or from this player over here, and this player would get to keep uh, the two gems that they put up. They would still lose the five that they paid to the bank, However, they would also gain one shell casing. The shell casing would sit in their player area in front of them. Now, if they were ever to be dismissed, they would not have the ability to duel their way back in unless they found a way to get rid of the shell casing, and there are uh, some cards that allow that to happen. So the play is going to proceed around that. So let's say that's happened now. This player here has now been eliminated because he lost a duel. We now move to the player over here who just dueled their way back in, who would be able to take their regular turn of two standard actions, paying for the second one if they choose, if they, if they roll a pip, or they can take a standard action and a card action. Once they've taken their actions, we move to this player who does the same, either two standard actions or a standard action and a card action. And then we move to this player who does the same. Once play comes back here, obviously this player's been eliminated, the shot glass is going to pass. The round marker is going to move down, so now we have five rounds left. This player would pay their ante, in this case two gems would get paid to the pot, and play would continue in the normal fashion. It's going to continue going around that table. Anytime a player takes a card action, that card action can be challenged by another player, and that results in a player being dismissed, whether they were caught being you know, whether they were caught lying or whether they were caught being truthful, one player is going to be dismissed. Whoever is quote unquote in the wrong is going to get dismissed and have the option to try to duel their way back into the game. Once all of the rounds are done, we enter the reveal phase. And in the reveal phase, you're gonna take all the players that are still in the game. So again, this player has been eliminated. He would not be part of the reveal phase. The other three players are going to count up and reveal how many gems they have. This player has three. Each of those players over there has 10 as it stands now, just because I didn't do anything with them for the purposes of this demo, or the purposes of this brief overview. The player with the most gems gets to uh, take one last raise action and, and raise uh, you know, any of these suits to try to strengthen their own hand. Um, the caveat is they can only use a number of gems equal to the, the fewest gems that a player has. So in this case, this player over here has three gems. So these players over here would only be able to use a maximum of three gems to raise one of these suits as they see fit if they need to. It's completely optional. It begins with the player who has the most gems and proceeds clockwise. They get one shot to raise them, uh, to raise the suits how they see fit. They're not penalized if they choose not to raise. It just simply is keeping them from potentially increasing the strength of their own hand. Once players have done that, the poker cards are revealed, so the hand of cards come out. So we have over here, we have a two, a six, and a seven. I didn't do anything with any of these hands, so it just depends on what got dealt. 
we have a two, a six, and a seven there. If we come up here to this player, this player has two sevens and a joker. So essentially three sevens because the joker is a wild card during the reveal. Um, it does have the ability to be removed from the game in order to cancel a challenge though. And this player over here has a two, three, and a five. So essentially a five high. The player up there would win any gems in the pot. So in this case, there are four gems. You would count up the number of gems that all players, including the eliminated players, have, and the player with the most gems is the winner. Now, these are only three card poker hands, so it's not your standard five card poker. So there are some important things to note when you're dealing with what has the most hand, what's which the strongest hand. Obviously, high card, you know, your single card with the highest value. If everybody just has a single card, whoever has the highest value is going to win. A pair beats high card, so two cards of the same value is going to beat a high card hand. If you have three of a kind, as we have up here with three sevens, that's going to beat a pair or a high card. A straight will beat a three of a kind. A straight is three cards in succession, so a two, three, four, five, six, seven, something like that, would beat a three of a kind. A flush, which is three cards of the same suit, is going to beat a straight. So if I have three bullets, for example, if I had three bullets in my hand, that would actually beat someone who had a straight, a two, three, four. And that's where the raising of the suits comes into play because if I have three bullets and my opponent has three skulls and there are more gems on this skull raise card, the skulls are more powerful than the bullets and the skull hand would win. So that's something that's there as well. And then you of course have the straight flush, which is having a two, three, four all of the same suit. So if we did two, three, four all in bullets, that would be the strongest hand you could possibly have. Um, if in the case of a tie, so if we have, you know, if two people have two, three, four uh, in a straight, the suits don't come into play with that. They simply split the pot um, that is there. So this is how you play Treacherous. And we're gonna, I'm gonna do a, a quick rundown of the, uh, the grifters and the card abilities that can happen um, in a separate little segment here before I give my final thoughts. So let's jump over. We'll do a quick breakdown of the grifters and the cards, and then I'll give you my final thoughts. Let's take a quick look at the Grifters and the Lady Luck cards. Now there are seven different Grifters in the game and there are seven different Lady Luck cards. Each Grifter gives you an ability that you're able to activate by simply claiming that you are that Grifter. Each Lady Luck card has an ability on it that you can take with your card action simply by claiming that you have that card in your hand. There are also situations where you can take special advanced actions by claiming that you have a grifter and a certain card. Each of the grifters are linked to, an, to a certain card value, as we saw with the mayor and the number five. So let's take a look at each of the grifters. Now, if any of this gets confusing, you have on the back of your player screen a breakdown of all of the grifters, the card there, there's, you have your grifter, your special ability, the card that they are associated with or they get the advanced ability with, and then an explanation of what the card on its own does. So they are all right on the back of your player screen, which is a great way um, I found during the game to help bluff. So if you've got your, your cards laying down here in your screen, you can be looking down at the cards and kind of be looking at your screen as well and be choosing your action, so it helps with bluffing. Let's take a look at the grifters and the lady luck cards, and I'll show you what, what each one does. Uh, if you successfully activate that ability. First, we're gonna take a look at the Gunslinger. The Gunslinger allows you during duels, if you reveal that you are the Gunslinger, then you get to do what's called Quick Draw, which means you roll a red die during your dueling. So and while your opponent's rolling the green die with one pip on it, you're rolling the red die that has three successes on it. So a much greater chance that you're going to roll a success first much, much easier for you to duel your way back in. One thing I didn't touch on when we were when we did the playthrough and we did the duel between these two players, if someone gets dismissed and they declare that they're going to duel, they're gonna come back in and they successfully duel their way back in, they get to activate the vengeance ability that is printed on their grifter's card. So if the gunslinger was dismissed, so let's say this player was the gunslinger, this player called them out for something, got them dismissed. They dueled their way back in successfully and eliminated this player. And this player gets murdered or killed or whatever you want to say it. They, in addition to staying in the game, this player also gets to activate this vengeance ability. And the vengeance ability on the gunslinger says that you can pay three gems to discard your shell casing, which is important because again, if you have a shell casing in front of you when you get dismissed, you can't duel again that if you're dismissed while the shell casing is in front of you, you can't do another duel to try and get back in the game, you're simply eliminated. But if you successfully duel with the gunslinger, you're gonna gain a, a shell casing like you normally would, but you have the option of paying three of your gems to get rid of that shell casing so you can duel your way back into the game. So that's the gunslinger uh, on his own, his own ability. The gunslinger 
uh, is connected to the ace. The ace, uh, the ability in the ace card says that it cancels high noon. That simply means if someone tries to, to attack you using the high noon ability, you can claim that you have the ace and you can't be targeted by high noon. Now, of course, they can call you out on that and dismiss and duel and all that. Any of these cards that we're looking at here can be called out, whether you're using a grifter ability, you're using a card ability or lady luck card ability, or you're combining them to use the advanced ability of the grifter. Um, any of those can be called out, so I'm not going to continually repeat that. Any of these card actions can be called out, which is going to result in someone being dismissed and someone possibly being able to duel their way back in and eliminating a player. So um, eliminations can happen very frequently in this game, and often do. So we've looked at the grifter. Uh, using his ability to be able to roll red die in the duels, and the ace that cancels the high noon ability. The high noon ability is the grifter's advanced ability. If during my card action I say I'm using high noon on another player, I'm paying two gems to the bank and dismissing a player, just outright dismissing them. In order to truthfully do so, so if a player calls me out and says, no, I think you're bluffing, if I can successfully show, I have to be able to successfully show that I have the ace in my hand and the gunslinger is my grifter. I have to show both. If one of those is true, it is untrue, then I'm bluffing and I'm the one being dismissed instead. So that is the, the gunslinger and the ace. I'll pop these out here in the middle of the table. Next, we move to the number two, which is the saloon girl. The saloon girl's vengeance ability, if you successfully duel your way back in, is that all active players give you a random lady luck card. Active players are players that are still in the game that have not been eliminated. Um, so if, if someone's been eliminated, this doesn't affect them. So that is her vengeance ability. The lady luck's basic ability uh, on the card is that uh, she can use distraction, which means that she can trade a lady luck card with another player. So I can simply, as the saloon girl, or even if I'm not the saloon girl, say I'm going to use distraction on this player and I'm going to trade them a lady luck card. And they can either trade a card with me, my, you know, I would pick my card, they would pick their card, and we would trade cards, or they can call me out, of course, and try to dismiss me, resulting in a duel. The number two card, if I, play, if, if I claim to have the number two in my hand, I can draw up to two Lady Luck cards. If I choose to draw two cards, all of my opponents that are still active in the game draw one Lady Luck card and add it to their hand. So this is a way for me to grab extra cards, uh, and for everyone else to get an extra one, if I draw two cards. If I choose to play this card and I only draw one Lady Luck card, no one else gets anything. Although you're probably more likely to be called out <laughs> because you're not giving anyone extra cards. This is a great bluffing card to use, um, being able to say, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna use my the ability on my two. I'm going to draw two Lady Luck cards and let everyone else have a card. That people may just take the card rather than trying to call you out. So this is a pretty easy one to bluff with. But you have to be careful. Now, if you combine the Saloon Girl and the number two, you get to use the Butter You Up ability, which means you choose a player, you look at their Lady Luck cards, and then you have the option of trading a card with them. So it's kind of a souped up version of the standard trading a card action there. The Preacher, who's our number three, or cares about the number threes, the Preacher's special ability is, is he is what they call ta what is called tax exempt. He doesn't ever pay an ante. So when the Preacher is the first player, um, they don't pay an ante. Of course, you can claim that you are the preacher. If you're not, I could be the saloon girl and say, I'm the preacher, I'm not paying the ante. And if people let it go through, I don't have to pay the ante. Of course, they can call me out, like always. The vengeance ability on the preacher, if I successfully duel my way back in, is that each player has to pay me two gems. So the preacher gets some extra money there for that. The number three card allows me, if I have to pay an ante, I can pay one gem, and the richest player ante's one gem. Um, so... Rather than paying the two gems myself in a four to seven player game, I can pay one gem and have the richest player pay uh, the other gem for me. And of course, this could be challenged as well. If I combine these two together, so if I claim to have the preacher and the number three, uh, I do what's called bowing out, which means during the reveal phase, I can fold. Say, I, I know my hand's not the strongest, I'm going to fold, and I'll simply take five gems out of the pot. We move to the Undertaker. The Undertaker loves it when people get eliminated from the game because his ability is that when someone gets eliminated, he gets to take four gems from the bank whenever a player is eliminated. So when a player is eliminated, someone can claim they're the Undertaker and take four gems from the bank. His vengeance ability is to dismiss the player that dismissed you. So if, if the Undertaker gets dismissed, successfully duels his way back in, not only um, not, not only does the does the player does does he get back in and not be eliminated, but he gets to dismiss the other player, uh, and then that player would have to try and duel their way back in as well. So, kind of a nasty ability there. The number four, 
uh, is to gain one gem when a player is eliminated. So the Undertaker can gain four gems with his special ability, or his, his ability. He can gain four gems. The number four card lets you gain one gem. So again, a player gets eliminated, you claim you have the four, and you're going to gain a gem. And of course, people can call you out. <clears throat> Using these in conjunction with one another, um, if someone tries to modify your hand, so a, a player's ability or an opponent ability tries to modify your hand, uh, you can claim that you are the Undertaker and have a four in your hand, and they can't modify your hand. So it's a way of blocking uh, modification of your hand. Number five is the Mayor. We saw the Mayor earlier. Uh, the Mayor is simply worth seven gems at the end of the game, so that's his special ability. Uh, if combined with the number five, you can do Taxation, which allows you to take one gem from one player and one gem from the pot. And the five on its own allows me to not be targeted for Taxation. So if someone tries to tax me, uh, I can say I've got the five and they can and, and block that Taxation. The next grifter in line is the Doctor. Uh, the Doctor's special ability, uh, he, you choose a player, that player reveals their grifter uh, to the Doctor. So if I'm the Doctor, that the, the player I choose would reveal their grifter to me, or they can pay me a gem. Uh, or, of course, they can call me out and say, you're not the Doctor, and we, get dis we do the whole dismissal dueling thing again. The Vengeance ability on the Doctor, if I successfully duel my way back in, is that everyone shuffles their grifter back into the deck and draws a new one. So the Doctor's Vengeance ability can cause a lot of chaos um, there. The number six ability cancels looting. So if someone tries to loot me, I can cancel looting. Well, what is looting? Looting is the special ability that you have the ability to use if you have the doctor and a six in your hand, or are claiming you do. <laughs> um, and looting allows you to collect one gem from an eliminated player. So you're basically looting the body of someone who's been eliminated previous. Uh, this is one instance where the eliminated player can can do something uh, rather than just sit there and wait for the game to end. Um, if if someone if someone who has the doctor and tries to loot uh, is trying to loot an eliminated player, that eliminated player can reveal that they have that one of their lady luck cards is a six, and that will cancel looting. And that card can stay revealed so that then players don't try to uh, loot that person anymore because it does indeed uh, have an ongoing effect. It's not a one-time use. So that is the doctor. Finally, we come to the gambler. The Gambler is a really cool, uh, this is probably my favorite uh, of, the, of the grifters in the game. She has the ability uh, called I Make My Own Luck, where I simply draw two Lady Luck cards as my card action. Uh, again, she could be called out, of course. Uh, her Vengeance, if so, she gets called out and dismissed and successfully duels her way back in, her Vengeance ability is to just take five gems from the pot. So if you dismiss her and she's able to get her way back in, she's going to take five gems from the pot and uh, reduce the size of that pot for the end of the game. Uh, the number seven card, uh, during the reveal at the end of the game, if you have three sevens in your hand and you lose, then you get to split the pot. So the, so that the, who, so if, if I lose with three sevens, I get half of the pot. Uh, and then the other player, you know, whoever won the hand's only going to get half of the pot. So uh, that's a very cool ability. Now, if I combine the two of them or claim to be combining the two of them, I have what's called hot hand, um, where during the final reveal, uh, I can adjust one of my cards in my hand, up one, down one, or I can change the suit uh, of that. So it can help out in that final reveal phase. The only other Lady Luck card that is here is the Joker. Uh, this is not related to any grifter at all. Um, this card is simply a card you would hold in your hand. It counts as a wild if it's in your hand during the reveal. Um, and uh, if someone were to challenge me, so if I were to, let's say I said I'm the gambler, and I'm not actually the gambler. I'm just trying to draw two cards uh, to add to my hand and help build a better a better poker hand for myself. If someone calls me out on that and I don't want to be dismissed, I don't want to try to do it my way back in, I can simply reveal this joker, remove it from the game, and cancel that challenge. There are two of these joker cards in the game. And I should point out with the Lady Luck cards, even though they are ace through seven, there are four of each of the numbered cards. Ace through seven, there are four of each, one of each suit. Uh, the Jokers, of course, there are only two of those, and they are considered suitless cards. So those are the cards in the game. We've talked about and given a brief overview of how the game plays. Let's jump over, and I'll give you my final thoughts on Treacherous. So that's a brief overview of Treacherous. Again, from DNA Games and designer Alan McFarland. Um, the game itself, um, first of all, I want to say the art style. I love the art in this game. It's very unique. It does a great job of capturing that sci-fi westerny feel um, that, that you're wanting in the game uh, it's got some you know robots and and you know alien looking creatures and, and kind of lizard guys and it's a lot of fun so um, as far as the art goes I, I love it it's it's not dark and and you know brooding it's not cartoony it, it, it strikes a perfect balance between the two um, gameplay wise um, 
I have to say, I honestly, I wasn't expecting much when I came into this game, uh, if I'm being perfectly honest. Uh, I read through the rule book, and I'm like, okay, we're going to play a poker hand after some rounds of trying to build a poker hand. Um, and it, it, to me, it didn't strike me as something that was going to be super exciting. Uh, I love, like I said, I love supporting local designers, so I was excited to get the opportunity to do that. Um, and so that's why I wanted to take a look at the game. I sat down and played the game, and the first time I played it, um, I was floored by how good it is. Uh, the bluffing aspect, the deduction aspect of trying to figure out who is what grifter, who you know, who may what, who may have you know, which cards in their hand. If I've got a couple of fives and someone's claiming they have a five, there's you know, a fifty percent chance they could be lying to me. So, um, the deduction aspect of that. In, in my overview, I likened it to uh, coup in the fact that I can claim that I have the ability to take this action. Someone can call me out and prove that I'm lying and kick me out. Um, that's very cool. I've always enjoyed Coup. Uh, this just ramps it up a notch because in Coup, I have a character. That character lets me take an ability. Um, in Treacherous, I have a character that lets me take abilities. I have a, I have cards that if I have if I claim to have a certain card, those cards give me abilities. And I have that advanced ability that if I'm saying I have this grifter and this card, I can do something extra special. Um, and both conditions have to be true for me to win any challenges. Um, it kicks that coup feeling up a notch because there's more that I can do. I have more options available to me on the table. Um, and then still having the ability to take standard actions of just taking you know one gem from the bank or, or raising to increase the strength of my own hand because I see that I'm going to have a flush and I want things to be stronger when I get to that reveal phase. So the game itself, like I said, when I first read the rule book and saw, okay, I'm, I'm spending a few rounds building a poker hand, we reveal poker hands, someone's going to win the pot, have the most gems and win. It didn't sound that exciting. But when you add the bluffing mechanism into it and the ability to be eliminated from the game or dismissed by being called out on your bluffing, it ramps that game up. Uh, there have been so many times I've played this game now where um, the laughter is off the charts, you know, or, you know, because someone thought they were going to get away with something and they got called out um, on it. Maybe it's a situation, I've had situations where someone was claiming that two ability to be able to draw up to two cards and everybody, you know, I'm, I'm going to draw two cards, everybody else can draw one and no one was calling them out on it. They'd done it for three rounds. When they tried it the fourth time, Someone called them out, and they had been lying the entire time. Uh, so it, it's things like that, moments like that in games that really capture you um, and and make for that memorable experience. So you're not just playing a game, you're sharing an experience with friends. Treacherous really gives you a great feeling of, um, you know, kind of pulling one over on your friends. Uh, you can certainly go through the entire game never lying uh, and, and, and never telling a lie. Uh, however, you're likely not going to do terribly well if everyone else at the table is lying to your face. Uh, you have to be willing to challenge people on it. Um, there are going to be groups of people out there where this game's not going to work for. If, you, if your your game group it doesn't enjoy bluffing games, deception games, if you're not the type of gamer that enjoys lying to your friends, uh, this may not be something that you like. There are there are some take that moments in the game as well. Overall, it's an absolute blast. It plays really quickly. You're looking at an hour, uh, you know, maybe an hour and a half if you've got you know six or seven players. Uh, it does go pretty quickly uh, as players are calling each other out. There are instances where, okay, I've dismissed you. I've dueled my way back in. My vengeance ability now lets me dismiss you for dismissing me. Uh, and, and another duel happens and, and just keeps chaining like that. That gets to be a lot of fun as well. Definitely check out Treacherous. It's on Kickstarter now. There's a link down in the description of this video uh, over their Kickstarter page. Uh, definitely, I, I, I would highly recommend giving uh, their support. I would love to see this game get published. You do have the option, um, and this is you know prototype still, um, but. Uh, there is a standard version of the game there on Kickstarter that's going to be uh, you know cardboard box uh, like normal. You're going to have plastic shell casings. Um, there a plastic shot glass for your first player marker. Um, there's a deluxe wooden box edition. Uh, it's going to come in a box similar to this. This is obviously a prototype wooden box, but a box similar to this. Um, the treacherous logo as well as possibly even the DNA Games uh, company logo are going to be branded or kind of burned into the wood. You'll have a glass shot glass um, brass brass shell casings uh, so you're making that game pop on the table a little bit more uh, but that's treacherous from DNA games definitely check them out over on Kickstarter if you have any questions comments drop them in uh, the comment section below if I can't answer the question I'll definitely get a hold of Alan um, Alan is super responsive uh, to anyone who's backing his campaigns uh, if you've seen his 
uh, weekly Facebook videos, designer diaries. Uh, he's, he's really involved in, in keeping communications open with the community. So uh, you can ask questions here at the bottom of this video. You can hit him up on Facebook. I'm sure he'd be happy um, through the DNA Games page to answer any questions you may have. And until next time, keep gaming, friends.